So he starts by saying, first of all, we have to take the Buddha as an example. Where is the ultimate truth? When he was a prince, he was searching for liberation. And the liberation is the Dhamma to end all the sufferings. The end of suffering is the ultimate truth. So now I just want to point out that the ultimate truth, like what does this mean? We have to kind of think about this term and not just sort of take it as a, oh, the ultimate truth without sort of examining it. So the ultimate truth doesn't mean anything other than the truth that has nothing beyond it. Like there's nothing further or beyond that. It can have nothing beyond it. So then this should kind of be borne in mind when he goes on. So he continues, where is the ultimate truth? Will the eyes bring forth, show anything to the Buddha? So what he's pointing out here is that the ultimate truth, the Dhamma, can't possibly be something we see with our eyes or that we perceive through any of our other senses. It can't be an object of our sense. Because the ultimate truth is the truth about the nature of things. It can't be in itself a thing that we discover in the world because it already has to include the world and anything we could discover in it. Like it can't just be this one uh, sentence that you hear and that is in itself the ultimate truth or something you see, that a vision or, or experience or whatever that is in itself the ultimate truth. So he continues, Nothing. The ultimate truth is inside, inside his body and his mind, the mind of the Buddha, when the Buddha was found it. So the ultimate truth is also inside ourselves, in each one of us. But whether we will practice to see it or not is up to us. If we practice, we will have the ultimate truth within ourselves. So again, let me point out here, inside, when he says it's inside us, obviously it doesn't literally mean inside my body. You know, it's not an organ inside my body. and Or inside my mind, what does that mean? You know, it's not something that obvious or that easy to, to see. You shouldn't just kind of take it at the face value. The mind and the body are not the things that we can see, hear, experience with our senses. Precisely because if we see when we're seeing, that's already because of, based on the mind and the body. The body and mind are not in front of us, in front of our eyes or in front of what we hear. It's not something that we can look at directly. Because the body and the mind are always the the basis for us looking at anything or hearing anything or thinking about anything. And that's true no matter what the object is, no matter whether we're just looking at, let's say, watching a movie with our eyes and ears or whether we are, you know, thinking very hard about a concept in Dhamma that we are trying to understand theoretically, it's still the body and the mind are not in that concept that we're thinking about, if you know what I mean. It's the body and mind that have to be there to think about it. And when he says, you know, so the ultimate truth is also inside ourselves, that's what means that it's possible to find it because it wasn't some specific thing that the Buddha could only find it only existed in his world at that time because you know the same nature of body and mind is there in us in our body and mind that's the same nature as it was for him there's no difference so that's what it means if we practice we will have the ultimate truth within ourselves we can't just get the idea of the truth from somebody else and then sort of take it. It's not like an idea that you can take and accept or reject. You have to uh, embody it. You have to sort of become it, basically. So that's actually to you know, remove one's wrongdoing, wrong saying and wrong thinking. Then the body and mind will sort of embody the ultimate truth, whether it's your body and mind or the body and mind of the Buddha. So Lumpa continues, there are four things, that is suffering, cause of suffering, stopping of suffering, which is to let go of the cause, then the end of suffering will arise. At the present moment, whenever you can abandon the cause of suffering, the end of suffering arises and the path to end suffering. So, I mean, it's fairly 
self-explanatory, but I would again just like to kind of point out what this is saying. It's kind of important to get us that the Four Noble Truths are not just this sort of um, thing that you can understand at the level of an idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, I get the idea. It makes sense. What he's saying here is that if you understand and know the cause of suffering and suffering and how they are related, that in itself means that you are abandoning the cause of suffering, you reach the end of suffering, and this is the path. Like, it's all to be done in the present moment. So if you're not freeing yourself from suffering, then you're not understanding the Four Noble Truths. And also that none of them can be taken in isolation from each other. We can't really talk about suffering you know, if we are understanding suffering correctly, then it means we're also understanding the cause of suffering. And if we're understanding the cause, we are understanding the path to end suffering. And the, you know, they're all basically almost one thing, but like a cube with different faces, different aspects of the same thing. So Lungpa continues, The ultimate truth is within the five aggregates. The ending is also in the five aggregates. The cause of the five aggregates is in this five aggregates also, craving and holding due to ignorance. So what he's saying here again is that the ignorance is not ignorance of something else, something sort of beyond the world that we see or something like that. Like the end of suffering is not to be found in another world beyond this one. When we are getting rid of ignorance, it means that we have to understand the five aggregates as well. Like if we say the ignorance is here, the cause is here, and the problem is here, all within the five aggregates, then we have to know what we're talking about to start with. So those five aggregates that are the site of the problem and its uh, solution as well, and its cause, we have to understand them. So again, when he says that the ultimate truth is within the five aggregates, that points to us or that says to us it doesn't give us the solution of our problem it says to find the solution look you have to go and understand what even this seemingly simple statement means obviously again if we're just kind of having a theoretical notion about it and we think we understand that's not real understanding it means that we have to see it see with understanding not just sort of having a a magical vision that explains everything for us we have to understand but it's understanding our own experience so Lumpa continues if we don't know when we search for Dhamma it's gone totally wrong without understanding this fact why is that? because the ultimate truth can only be known through seeing without seeing no way to distinguish wrong from right Right or wrong is within the five aggregates. Stopping of suffering is at the five aggregates, not to allow the five aggregates to arise any further. What is the cause of the end of the five aggregates? Abandoning avicca, which is ignorance, and tanna, which is craving, within the mind. If we don't start from here, no way to end the suffering. Desires and attachments are all in this five aggregates. Abandoning of the ignorance, desire and attachment is also the abandoning in this five aggregates, nowhere else. So, as I said, what he's pointing out is that you can't search for the Dhamma in philosophical ideas or explanations. You do need them as indicators, but only in the same sense of using a map, not thinking that the perfect map will be, you know, I have the perfect map and that means I am already where I want to go. You have to find it in your experience then it can't be contradicted by anyone or anything. And that's what it refers to also when he says right or wrong is within the five aggregates and stopping of suffering is within the five aggregates. So when we talk about right and wrong, that is the correct understanding of right and wrong doesn't require anybody else's definition or any external authority to tell you what is right and wrong. And in fact you know, the correct understanding can't possibly admit anybody else's definition. But obviously we don't start out like this. We have to see that as it is as well. Like we don't start out knowing for ourselves already what is right and wrong for ourselves. We need the guidance of the Buddha 
And then through that guidance, we can come to become independent of any external authority regarding right and wrong. Lumpa continues then, The teaching which does not show the suffering of the five aggregates is of no use, without realizing the suffering that the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind are enemies, problems, there is no way to end the sufferings. Not knowing this hides the truth from us. But when we don't know how to do it, to end this, one must stop the not knowing of the cause. Because of avicca, ignorance, the wisdom to see clearly to the bottom of things is hidden from us. So when he says the teaching that doesn't show the suffering of five aggregates is of no use, that's important. The Buddha, when he was describing suffering, he spoke about birth, aging, death, sorrow, sickness, pain and distress, but then he went on to sum it all up by saying that, in short, in summary, these five held aggregates are suffering. So it's not, when we think about suffering, it's not just, you know, one loss or a particular trouble or pain. The real suffering that has to be understood is the entire situation that you hold that you take as yours and there's nothing beyond that. It's not like you can find a better version of the five held aggregates, the aggregates that you hold as yours, because that would still be five aggregates and the entire entirety of the five held aggregates that you hold as yours are suffering, dukkha. And held means holding you know, upadana, it's the word in Pali. Holding is one's own, which is always the default. It's the, you know, you, you, you start out like that. And if you're not seeing that, you're not seeing the nature of suffering in that whole situation, this is the nature of ignorance. And he also says, note, not knowing this is what's hiding the truth. It's not like the truth is hidden behind a magical veil. It's literally not knowing that hides the truth. And this is exactly what he goes on to say next as well. So he continues, one having wrong view never knows he is wrong. He thinks he is right. Not knowing, just like that, not knowing if it's in front, side or outside, or when it ends. But when we polish again and again, something will reveal itself. Wisdom is the same. We must polish our own mind, not polishing somewhere else. It's this that makes us to know that it is only the five aggregates to be blamed. So when one has wrong view, this is me again continuing, when one has wrong view, it's precisely not knowing one is wrong that makes one wrong. And that's also why you can't get rid of wrong view by just picking up a different idea. You can't just add another idea on top of your wrong view and then kind of correct it. That's also, you know, you need to develop the, the right view. And that's what polishing is. It doesn't come in isolation, as in just thinking or just reading or just studying or doing one technique or something. It goes with morality and discipline. And that's because the nature of ignorance is not just a fact that you need to kind of get a different fact and that will solve it. And right view is not a fact either. It's sort of a, a way for the mind and to be. The way that you understand yourself, your world... It's almost what you are. So that's why even just having the right understanding requires training. It's it's the entire Eightfold Path. Lumpa continues by giving an example. He says, Do we know that there is the ultimate truth in one hair? There are sufferings, cause of sufferings, stopping the suffering and the path to end suffering in one hair. Do you see how you doubt, how you're not sure about how it is that the ultimate truth is in one hair? And it's quite clear that if we have no doubt left, we will instantly agree with this. So I just want to point out then, to make it clear that it doesn't mean we should just say, ah, okay, yes, four noble truths are in one hair, without seeing how and why that is. What he's kind of trying to show you is that if you're kind of confused about that statement, why the Four Noble Truths are in one hair, or if you have to kind of then think about it and explain it to yourself a lot, to kind of say, okay, maybe you're saying this or that, that's your doubt, that's your work. 
So it's not to kind of just say, oh, no, 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 me, I have no doubt. No, yes, uh, he says, he says correctly or whatever. You know, you have to see that that's your work. That's where you need to develop, basically. So Lumpa continues, as the Buddha saw sufferings, we see sufferings. He saw the end of sufferings, we see the end. He saw the cause of sufferings, we also see the cause of sufferings, the practice to end the sufferings. If we also practice seriously to end the sufferings the same way, it will truly end within us. We must really see through this. So the talk continues a bit more, but I think I will leave it there for the moment and do the second half another day.